Hello and welcome to episode two of This Is Not A Book Club podcast. Um, as you can see, I'm not in the studio and Javad isn't here either. We forgot to record the intro uh, to this episode, so I'm kind of doing it now as I'm editing the episode and getting it out. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking everyone that listened to the first episode for all the feedback that we got as well. It's been really helpful, the good and the bad. Uh, we've really appreciated it and, and we've been kind of inundated with the response and it's been so great to see so many people picking up the book, reading it um, and engaging with it. Now, in terms of where you can find the podcast, so we are on YouTube and you can watch the video on Spotify as well and the audio is available basically everywhere. If I can ask kindly that um, if you have enjoyed the podcast, uh, if you can leave us a five star rating and like a nice review wherever you listen to the podcast, even if you didn't like the podcast, we would still appreciate the five stars and the nice review, although you might be lying a little bit, but it's fine. Um, and uh, just before we get into the actual podcast itself, we might start doing two episodes a month. We're kind of unsure yet, but if you feel strongly that we should do more episodes more regularly, then leave a comment somewhere and we will hopefully listen. Um, that's it, really. This week, we are discussing The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. Uh, why good people are divided by politics and religion. Now, the conversation was quite heavy um, and I think that's partly why we forgot to record the intro. We usually record the intros straight after we record the episode. Um, but it's, uh, it's a fascinating read. I think uh, once you get your head around the concept and you really get into it, it's, it's actually quite mind-blowing, to be honest. Um, just... The, the, the level of understanding that you can have on the, the human mind and on people and society in general, but it is a lot heavier than the previous book we did. And that's why also next week we're going to be talking about, sorry, next podcast we're going to be talking about Atomic Habits, um, something a little bit lighter. So we're trying to mix it up, but this book in particular, um, we cover as much as we can in the podcast, but I definitely recommend if you can try and read this book because there's just so many incredible things uh, about the human mind. Um, to unpack and society uh, uh, in general. To be fair, all the books that we pick are, pick are good, um, or at least we intend them to be. That's why we kind of discuss them. But this one in particular, um, I felt out of my depth at times, but having gone through the whole journey and having had that conversation with Javad afterwards on the podcast, um, it's definitely shifted the way in which I look at the world, essentially. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's about it from me. Uh, like, subscribe, follow, leave us a review, all of that stuff. And let us know. I think feedback is really important. So do let us know what you think. Send us a message on Instagram. This is not a book club pod um, is our username. Um, and yeah, without further ado, here is episode two of This is not a book club. So welcome back to This is not a book club podcast, episode two. Um, as always, I'm your host, Salim Qasim, and I'm joined by Javot, who is also a host, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> so today's book is, oh, firstly, I guess we've, we've downgraded from the laptop because I, I forgot it at my mum's house. Um, but we have our phones. So if you see us, if you're watching this on YouTube, we are going to be on our phones. We're not texting. We are reading. Um, and to start off with today's book is The Righteous Mind, why good people are divided by religion and politics. Uh, just a brief overview of the author himself. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist at New York University's Stern School of Business. He received a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992 and taught for 16 years in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia. Haidt's research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultures, including the cultures of American progressive conservatives and libertarians. Managed to read that perfect. I, I think I'm getting better at this. Yeah, yeah. I think with practice, hopefully well, by the 10th yeah. episode, yeah, we'll have some. <laughs> okay, so uh, in, in terms of the book itself, uh, we'll, we'll get to kind of our our scorings after the first half of like yeah. what we thought of the different areas. Yeah. But just like an overview, in a, in a sentence or two, yeah. how would you sum up this book? So as the subtitle of the book says, yeah. it's talking about why are people divided on the issues of, for example, religion, politics, but it's not even limited to that. Why is it that people end up on the two different sides of, for example, a political debate or even a religious issue? And so he tries to give three reasons for this. 
that are not just that the other group is bad. Like he actually tries to give three good psychological reasons why these differences of opinions happen that when people try to talk each other it just doesn't even happen it's like they're talking at each other it goes you know mm. they miss each other's point they can't see the world from each other's point of view and he gives three reasons for that uh, which we're going to talk about um, during the podcast there was one early on in the book he kind of gives a few different hypothetical moral scenarios mm. and i wanted to present one and maybe people can think about it and then maybe in the second half of the the podcast we can start we'll off by, to, by yeah. exploring it so the scenario is that uh, a family's pet dog dies mm-hmm. um, by natural causes and the family are for some reason intrigued and they decide let's cook the dog and eat the meat rather than burying it. Mm-hmm. Nobody witnesses them doing this and um, they don't do anything like this again. And the question is, did they do anything wrong? Mm. Um and this is something that he kind of gives as a hypothetical along, alongside many others to, oh, to loads of different examples. people yeah. um, and, and gets, gauges their kind of responses. I think for me, what I enjoyed about the book, like it, it, was, it, it was a tough read in the sense that I think at times it was very um, deep on the kind of psychological mm. side, a lot mm. of different theories. Mm-hmm. But he kind of, he takes you on the journey of his own kind of evolution mm-hmm. um, from a, mm-hmm. from a morality perspective. Yeah, and it's a very personal journey, but at the same time, he kind of, you know, pits two different theories against each other, mm-hmm. and then reasons them as much as he can. Yeah, and then says, okay, I sided with this because this kind of makes more sense to me, and then that forms the foundation of like the work he carries on to do. Yeah, and it just kind of goes from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, what what did you think i guess uh how, like how, how, I, it'd be interesting to know because obviously we come from different backgrounds academically uh reading this what how did what did you make of it i guess in contrast even to some of the lighter stuff like the honest truth about yeah. dishonesty last time around yeah obviously the honest truth by daniel daniel was was a much lighter read mm-hmm. this one had yeah in, especially initially a lot of theories but slowly slowly you get used to what he's trying to do yeah so it gets easier well it's a tough initially to pick off but once you're like, I think maybe one third into the book, yeah, yeah. you get used to what he's trying to do. And as you said, he does share his own journey. Like it's like you go on this journey with him. But let's start actually talking about the example you mentioned. I think that's a good place to get into the book. Go for it. Uh, so family's animal, animal the, the, the dog yeah. uh, passes away, dies, mm-hmm. and they eat him. And uh, yeah, so... He asked this question to people. It's like, do you think that's morally wrong or not? And um, it's very interesting that some people feel it's wrong, but they can't articulate it, mm. right? They're like, oh, I feel like this is wrong, but like, why is it wrong? And then they can't articulate it. They're, Sorry, there's another yeah. example that he gives where I remember this yeah. point because he, he, that's where he shared the feedback where someone is going through their old stuff and they find like an American flag. This was conducted in America. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an old flag. It's battered or whatever. They decide to cut up the flag and use the pieces as rags to like clean the house. Yeah. And again, when he asked people, and again, no one saw him do this. Like what's wrong with this? Mm -hmm. People couldn't quite articulate what they found to be problematic. Yeah. And and so this is maybe a good um, place or a segue to talk about the first point of the book. Because as we said, he gives three reasons mm. why people are divided on political issues. And this is the number one, which is that he says intuition comes first, moral reasoning comes second. And he says that in a lot of these studies, he realized that people first have an internal gut feeling about if something is moral or not. And then they try to come up with reasons as to why that is the case. And sometimes this takes them to very silly places because they don't know how to articulate it. So they just say the randomest things. And for example, in... um, I think it was in one of the issues about it, what do you think about two siblings yes. having um, intimate relationships. And some people had that intuition that this is morally wrong. And when he asked them, why is this wrong? Reason. Uh, they came up with reasons that were not even applicable. For yeah. example, they said, well, what about the children? The, ch- the children coming from that relation between siblings may have illnesses. And he says, no, there was no, like they made sure that's not going to happen, yeah, yeah, for yeah. example. So that is not a concern. But still, they were coming up with the other reason. So it showed that for them, the 
morality compass basically is an intuition thing and so that's the point number one that intuition comes first you feel like this is wrong then you try to come up with a reason for it and and he gave he, he kind of painted it out as like an elephant and a rider which mm. i thought was perfect so he said intuition is basically an elephant and the rider is your um reasoning. Your, your moral reasoning yeah. so the, the elephant is obviously much larger much more powerful than than the rider than yeah. the uh the reasoning and and the elephant is always going in a certain direction then the the intuition sorry the uh, the, the moral reason. reasoning kicks in and you can try and steer it a little bit but the intuition always goes first and is much bigger and much harder to to change yeah so when you ask someone if this if a certain act is moral or not the decision is not based on the reasoning the decision is based on that initial gut feeling yeah. they have and the interesting thing is even if you try to reason with them usually it doesn't work which was very interesting as well he they did a study in which they tried to give people arguments against their belief but even reading an argument against their belief actually made them more convinced about their own belief. Mm. In other words, you can't talk to the rider of the elephant. If you want to change someone's moral opinion, you have to talk to the elephant. So you have to talk to their intuitions. You have to convince them emotionally as opposed to but just... It, yeah. it was even like talking about the, the environment. So for example, I think he did a, a study where he asked people questions mm -hmm. and he had, it was like in, a, in public and there was a, a dustbin and he had like sprayed some, essentially yeah. some fart spray in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the bin to make it very sort of foul smelling. And uh, almost all the people that were there when, when there was a foul smell, their judgments were a lot harsher. They were a lot more critical. Yeah. Um, and when there was a nice smell, people were, were lighter and whatever else and and again what i found really interesting is that we're so influenced by all these things that mm -hmm. are on like a subconscious level so you yeah. don't know that like for example if you're feeling pain or if you're upset or whatever the way that you interact and the way that you reason things is actually impacted by that and exactly. it's not reasoning first it's actually intuition intuition kind of yeah level. things that sometimes you may not be you may not even be aware of it are impacting your your judgment and maybe that's actually a good segue to go to the second part of the book yeah because because um, you were saying that sometimes a environmental factors impacts a person's um, moral reasoning basically mm -hmm. or intuition um one of the interesting thing was that when a group is under attack the kind of things which becomes important for them changes so, for example, if before that, what is very moral thing for them to do is to be open to, you know, diversity, more opinions, openness, etc. Once a group is under attack, um, I mean, not for everyone, but usually what happens is that some other things become important morally for people. So sticking to the group, being loyal, punishing the traitors, which is very interesting. Something externally happens and suddenly changes your moral machinery. Mm -hmm. Whereas before that, you thought the most important moral thing to do in the world is hear everyone's opinions. But as soon as you're under attack, it's like, no, to protect my group. And you're not even maybe aware that this is happening to you. But he was, for example, talking about how after, for example, being threatened, how the flag suddenly became so important for so many of the Americans that, you know, let's respect the flag. And and that's one of the, um, one of the, he, he calls it, we have like six um, moral foundations, um, or we can call it like taste receptors mm -hmm. for, for, for morality. It's basically six points in which, six category of of moral things and one of them was this basically the, the there was, sanctity yeah the, the, there was another um point that he mentioned which which i mm. thought you, we can all, again i think the important thing when reading a book like this is, is kind of put yourself in the position of of the, the test subject essentially yeah. so so with these concepts there's one where he said that when when you or your group is under attack mm -hmm. let's say Let's say, okay, you're, you're my friend. Let's say if someone says something about you that I don't agree yeah. with, or I think, no, you know, I, I don't want to believe that. Yeah. We ask ourselves this question, must I agree mm. with this? Yeah. Versus if it's like someone I don't like, yeah. I'll be like, okay, can I agree with this? Yeah. And and there's that subtle difference where, where it's either must I agree or can I agree? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's how we frame everything when it comes to thinking about, you know, what sits well with our intuition yeah. versus what doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's maybe a little bit scary to think like how when 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 you get across this concept of of our our reasoning not really um 
uh, controlling. Mm. It's quite scary to think that we are very much governed, almost like animals, on on a very uh, intuition based level. Yeah. Or is that that's the that's the notion that he kind of puts across? Yeah, yeah. And 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 he tries to prove that actually by studies, different studies. Yeah. And it's very interesting because um, before, you know. Psychologists started doing experiments. This discussion of what runs people's morality was usually done by philosophers. Mm. So traditionally, you had a lot of people who would say that reason should be in charge of a person's decision, and emotions, which sometimes they would call them passions, are um, like interfering with a person's moral reasoning. But the interesting thing is that now science shows that once a person's emotions are removed, and you get this in some patients, for example, that a certain part of the brain is damaged. And their their emotional response is absent. Mm. So you get actually to see how would a person behave when the elephant is no longer there and they're solely relying on on the rider, on their moral reasoning. And it turns out actually that they 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 really do horrendous things, immoral things. They ca- they lose their empathy. They cannot you know put themselves in the position of the other person, which is a very new thing that now science has really helped philosophers. That you need emotions to make moral decisions, and it may seem like oh my god, so I'm relying on my intuitions and emotions. But these emotions and intuitions are not like these are results of really long time of fine tuning, and so th- they're a lot of the times actually very useful. These are the things mm-hmm. that helps us be quite operative in our groups, you know, and recognize when something's going wrong. So these intuitions are very, very smart. Uh, at least we can say that. And uh, a very important part of our moral cognition. There, there was there was one more, um, at least in the, in the first half of the book, there's one more notion that he kind of talks about uh, weird societies, weird being an acronym. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I'm going to try and remember it. So Western, mm-hmm. educated, uh, rich, and there's an I in there. What's industrial. The industrial. Rich, in, uh, democratic. Rich and democratic. Countries. And he said that a lot of psychology studies are conducted on weird societies, on people that come from these uh, backgrounds. These backgrounds. But that statistically, that's not representative of, of the human population. Yeah. So firstly, that I think on one level in, in, in the study of human psychology, there is a... a, a Miscorrelation. I don't know if that's the right word, but you know what I mean. It, it, misrepresentation. Misrep- misrepresentation. Exactly of yeah. of the types of people, and and he also talks about societies on a mm. wider level, and he says that weird societies are a lot more individualistic, mm-hmm. where the individual comes first, whereas a lot of other societies are more uh, sociocentric. I think might be the yeah the community. Term. It's about community. community, family, the group, and there was uh, something else. Yes, so. <laughs> He gets uh, people to write 20 statements that start with I am. Mm. So, uh, again, when he does it with Americans, it's I am uh, creative, I am this, I am that, like, you know, talking about the self. Whereas with a lot of other communities, when people are doing this around the world, it's I am a father. So it's more relational. I am a son. I am a community member, whatever. It's a lot more relational in terms of the answers they give. Yeah. And again, that's something where even I was thinking about how if someone said to me, okay, write 20 statements saying I am, I wouldn't think about necessarily identifying as my relational identity, Mm -hmm. but rather like me as a person, Mm -hmm. because we are probably more egocentric in the way that we've been shown the world. I don't know. Mm. um, I I get you. And and I think he's not trying to say if one is better than the other. It's just mm. it's just important to acknowledge that. Mm. One group is not the only way to be. There are some yeah. societies in which individual values are more important and some in which collective values are more important. And uh, maybe this is a good time now to speak about the six moral yes. receptors that he yeah. comes with. You know, and, and the idea basically is he's saying that in the same way that we have taste receptors, for example, to get sweet stuff, savory stuff and whatnot. But a combination of these limited taste receptors gives us so many different foods. Mm -hmm. In the same way, we have six moral um, receptors, which based on these, you can have so many different cultures in which suddenly something becomes important. So the three individual ones is the care harm. That's number one. 
And basically, the idea of this is that, um, you know, the golden rule, do to others what you like to be done to yourself. Let's be kind to everyone. Let's reduce suffering. So this is one value of, of like moral values. If I'm not mistaken, even children on a very basic level understand the Care Harm Foundation. Yeah. Right? Based on the, ex- on, on the experiments that he conducted, yeah. that, that's like a, a thing that people understand. Yeah. And in weird societies, so these Western um, educated, educated rich, industrial, industrial, rich, yeah. democratic, care harm is one of the most important things so even in a lot of discussions they say if it's not harming anyone then problem? then it's moral yeah which um although we get into it like why these later other ones are important as well because sometimes you get into a case where your moral intuition says something is wrong but you can't explain why it's wrong just based on the harm thing right like for example there was that i don't even know, know if we can mention that study it was so horrendous they're going to put an ad on the newspaper that is there someone who would like to be eaten, eaten. by e- me that oh, was yeah. so weird that was very and weird and someone actually went there and the guy by his consent ended his life and then ended up eating him in different meals and so he's saying that when he asked his own students which most of them are weird as in fact from this background they couldn't explain why this is wrong because no one was harmed in the sense Mm. that the guy had consented to this being done on them but they felt this is horrendous and this is why he he was trying to tell his students for whom this is the only foundation for their morality that maybe there are other things as well Mm. that can be a foundation for theory it's not just if it's you know harming someone or not it's also i think part of the book he talks about when he goes to erisa um and and he lives amongst the community and and there he coming from like an atheist background starts to understand that, that that some societies have this kind of divine uh, link to how their morality is formed mm. and so it can't be understood on a, on a human level if we're just talking about care and harm yeah. because when there are societal implications whatever those implications might be however that society perceives them to yeah. be um, but people have that and, and that forms a foundation for a lot of people so I yeah. think especially people from religious backgrounds will have uh, a, a, let's say like a, a, a an understanding of the world that does incorporate an element of the divine mm. which can't be understood on on a purely kind of human level yeah yeah which which is actually one of the foundation he says and that's the sanctity degradation mm. right so basically the idea is that we don't make our moral reasonings just based on the care harm like is this going to be harming anyone or no they're okay so with what this the, what the he other says there's other ones one of them is the sanctity yeah. one for example um so some of them are in the, the individual ones, as we said, care, harm. Another one is li- liberty, oppression. Is someone being enslaved? Mm. When we feel that, we don't like it. We consider that immoral. Um, we had the fairness cheating, which is like people should get, uh, if they do something well, they should be rewarded for it. If they, should ch- if they cheat, they should get punished. This is another one of the evolutionary foundations for our morality so if we see someone cheats we want them to be punished so these are the three individual ones and then uh, he's saying that people who are um, liberal these are their main foundations of morality so they they, when they want to see if a decision is moral or not these these are the three foundations they use Mm. is it harming anyone is it oppressing anyone and um the cheating is it fairness and cheating and fairness to a lesser degree like he's saying for the liberals the main thing is that one but he's saying in addition to these there are other ones which is about keeping the group together yeah right and and and, and he's saying that in order for humanity to achieve bigger goals they need to be working together and if they want to be working together then there are certain things that needs to happen a certain dynamic between the group in to, so that the group can function and then achieve those goals. So these also impact on our decisions on morality. So one of them is the sanctity. So when something becomes sacred, it's he's, he's looking at it this way, that when something becomes sacred, it becomes a center for people to come around it. Mm. So if someone, for example, shows disrespect, let's say, to a flag, or to a religious item, he's saying maybe a liberal may look at it and be like, I don't get it. Why is that immoral? He's just, for example, disrespecting a book or a flag. But he's saying that, no, that flag represents, or that religious book represents what helps people to come together. 
And if they're not together, they can't achieve their goals, so they get harmed. So it actually is an important thing for the group to be together. And even on that, I, I remember he, he studies and looks at various communes, I think across the US, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. And he said that the communes that, were, that had an element of, of sacredness mm-hmm. attached to their beliefs and what they were doing always lasted longer mm. and, and and the society you know w- was better gelled together yeah whereas the more liberally inclined ones that just had the the individual individualistic moral virtues yeah or, or, or you know moral inclinations didn't last as long yeah because that element of sacredness and, and this is what i found very interesting personally that, yeah. that this whatever your views might be on religion yeah the fact is and, and i think he kind of makes this point that religion does bind people i mm. think he says he says morality binds and blinds yeah that's like exactly. a common common yeah. saying but yeah. but that's what it does right that it, it, it binds people together yeah but then it also blinds them in some regards you know and in other ways so that's actually one of the things yeah that he does spend some yeah. of the book talking about that he according to him religion was a way for people to be in large groups mm. that are not just their relatives because it's really difficult even when you look at it from an evolutionary point of view it's very difficult to explain why would people come together to achieve goals like we we barely see it in in some other animals yeah although he does exa- gives examples of where you see this in the animal kingdom but he says that religion was one of the ways people this um, basically managed to come together in large Large numbers that are not the relatives to achieve goals. So that was his view of religion, and this is why, for example, um, this is part of the collective values. And another one of them, for example, is loyalty betrayal. Mm. Are you betraying a group or are you loyal to the group? But the important thing here is that this doesn't mean that um, one of these are better. Like, for example, the conservatives, for whom the um, although they they have all of these, but conservatives are usually more inclined towards the collective values, liberal more towards the individual. It doesn't mean one is better than the other. Mm. And and his idea is that you need both of these to get to the perfect balance. Because on the one hand, you need the collective values to make sure we have a group. We don't just, you know, get fragmented and just like collapse. So you need people who whose main emphasis is like, come together, even if it's sacrificing some individual values, as long as we're together, because if we're not together, certain things can happen. But if these are the only people there, then the hierarchy or the group may slowly become pathologized. It may become tyrannical. So you also need some people who push for individual values. Like, yes, we need a group, but don't be too oppressive. Don't be too tyrannical. Mm. And it's in the, uh, we can call it like the uh, argument between these two that maybe the perfect balance is is found. And I think he also, I mean, he was looking predominantly at U.S. politics, Mm -hmm. but he he did speak about, and you can see the parallels with the U.K. spectrum for those listening in the U.K., But he, he spoke about how things have become so partisan mm. out there and, and so divisive that there is no middle ground anymore, which yeah. is why, you know, you, you've, you've seen when you look at uh, recent U.S. politics, how votes have been very split and there's a huge divide. Yeah. And th- there isn't that coming together. So things yeah. are just becoming more and more polarizing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the shocking bit, I mean, not shocking in the sense that I didn't expect it, but it's just so sad still, mm. was that when he... Uh, he got uh, his liberal students and his conservative students to fill a questionnaire as if they're the other side. Yeah, yeah. So liberals act as if you're a conservative, conservative. And when he asked some of, for example, these liberal students, they couldn't put themselves in the place of a conservative. Like, for example, they were asked, why would you do this? He said, I do this because I don't care about people. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. They legit thought that that's the moral reasoning mm. of the person. I don't care about people. Let's do that. Um, and he said that conservative manage better to put themselves. Although I think if the study's done now, I think both sides may struggle to, to, to really get the point of view of the yeah. other side. But it's very interesting that we can't even see why the other person is thinking that way. We don't have to agree with them, but at least like see why are they. Um, and it's interesting. I was watching a review of the book by a a lady who said, I'm a liberal myself. And she said, actually reading the book, I managed to understand why some conservative people come with the decisions they come up with. Mm. And she said, I still disagree with them. Yeah, yeah. But at least now, 
it makes sense. Like, what is the you know A to Z in their mind that they come up with those kind of? So, so that I, I think that was also my experience to an extent. When you, when you start looking at the the six moral foundations, and you start to appreciate that, okay, maybe I lean on certain moral foundations, whereas others, if they emphasize the other moral foundations to a higher extent than me, and and there's no one, I think no one can say, okay, this is a more important moral found like care versus um, loyalty or. Blanking on the on the names of the foundations. Which other ones do we have? We there? have sanctity. We have oppression. We have authority. We have uh, fairness, cheating. Yeah. So if if, if we take like uh, any of those, yeah, and and I ask someone to rank them one to six, mm. it's not easy, and everyone's list will will be, be different. different. Yeah. And, and and that's almost the beauty of it. That actually, as human beings, there is no like um, sacred order of morality. Mm. It's just that I, I don't think it exists. Yeah. Everyone, everyone is always going to, on some level, resonate with some things more than others. Which, which, which when you think about it, you see how, uh, in, if you want to look at it from an evolutionary point of view, mm. it's actually very smart the way it's been done. Because it's interesting that one of the things, again, in the book he was saying is that whether you're a liberal or conservative, not that this is the only reason behind it. There's so many factors. But one of it is that how you are person, how, what, what is your personality? Yeah. So if your personality is that you're high on openness, chances are you're going to become a liberal. And, and high on openness means that you like new experiences, you like new opinions, new ideas, meeting new people. And again, this is one of the things which you don't have that much say over in the sense that a lot of it is 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 is, is done by, by the time that you, you, before you even can make up these decisions, mm-hmm. right? So personality traits impact your political view. And it's interesting that people are divided into this and it shows that we need both type of people. We need some people who push for this. We need some people who push for that. Yeah. And um, so, and then if, for example, you're more interested in in order, in these kind of things, in order systems, you become a conservative. And if you look at it in a lot of the things, it, I, I just on. wanted to say I, I think it's important, and, and he emphasized a few times that it's not a case that you, you're you're basically inclined towards, inclined and, and, towards. and, there's, it's not and a, there's a big chance, yeah, but it's yeah. not like oh, because I'm a neat person or because my child is neat. Therefore, they're going to be a no, conservative. No, no, definitely. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, but, but I found that very interesting. Because he himself, he said he's disposed personality-wise to be a liberal. Mm. And that's where he started. As, and he said, the reason I went to psychology is because I wanted to um, help Democrats win. Yeah. I wanted to come up with, with... But then he slowly, slowly became interested in some conservative views as well. So it means that even him, he did manage to, to, to shift. In, in the interest of, of time, okay. I think the final, um, I guess, large topic that he talks about is the, the kind of groupish mm-hmm. mentality or the hive yeah. mentality. Yeah. Now, I, I was telling you on the way here that when I read it, it kind of made sense. Um, now, when I look back, I, 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 I remember the beginning bit and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the beginning, but then you'll need to kind of expand. Yeah, so so he talks about the, the hunter gatherers and how um, the way that they thrived and survived and, and grew as a society mm. was through shared intentionality. Mm. So as a group, the only way they could they could survive and grow was by working together, mm. coming together and, and, yeah. and being a unit and yeah. then also being better than other units of similar people mm-hmm. um and and you know there were scarce resources and basically having those resources and surviving and thriving yeah and he goes from from there that's where we as human beings essentially develop this knack for for being a part of a collective mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's just kind of gr- grown and evolved from there and he i think he gave some examples of like uh, sports mm-hmm. and american football teams or football teams um and and there you, you know you you see the passion that people have and then he spoke about the hive switch. Yeah. Well, which, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you want to... We'll, we'll get there. Let me just contextualize okay. yeah, this. Please. Then you mentioned that. Okay. Just to say, like, what, why, why is he talking about this? Because he's giving three reasons mm. why people end up on different sides of a political debates, for example, or a religious debate. So the first one was, it's based on people's intuitions. And so you can't really reason with each other. That's why you can't really debate. You have to talk to your... That was number one. Yeah. Number two was people have different moral foundations. So for you, for example, care matters. For another person, loyalty matters. And then number three is that people have this thing that they really care about their group. Mm. And so once you become part of a group, 
then you really want to make sure that your group is right to become blind to what the other group thinks. So this is why he's suddenly talking about this, that humanity has this group thing, because he's trying to explain why people are divided. He's saying that as soon as you become part of a group, it becomes difficult to see the other group's point of view. And so hence the divide. Uh, now talk about the, the hive switch. If you I was going to ask you to talk about the hive switch. <laughs> oh, okay. So... Uh, just again, so, so so from that, so I think you started it nicely that he's saying that we needed to work in groups to be able to achieve yeah. um, stuff. And so um, he's saying that for a long time, psychologists or even biologists were saying that humanity is selfish. Why? Because uh, natural selection, the stronger person, individual would, you know, survival of the fittest. So that one would survive. So we're selfish. And he's saying that, no, there is evidence that in addition to uh, natural selection happening at an individual level, in the sense that the stronger individual survives, it happens at a group level too. So the stronger group also survives. And what makes a stronger group? A group in which there's cooperation. Yeah. So that's why he's saying we're 90% chimp, which means that just individualistic, selfish, and 10% B. And why B? Because Bs also cooperate a lot, sacrifice. They lose themselves in the group to make sure the group survives, the group succeeds. And so he's saying that we're 90% selfish, but 10% cooperative. Mm. And so, uh, and, and he's saying that in those moments where we actually manage to transcend our selfish side, lose ourselves in the group, that's when he calls the hive switch mm. is is on because we're going to our B mode, not the chimp mode. So he he characterizes it in, in with two things. He says that number one is a, is is feeling small, um, and and secondly is having an experience that needs assimilating into our mental structures. Mm. So. Um, essentially need they're needing to be a change internally yeah. to reconcile the experience that you've had yeah and then he kind of uh segues and starts talking about um drugs yeah and he talks about the drug scene in the us and and mdma ecstasy and how that and also uh, is it ayahuasca yeah, yeah, ayahuasca, um, psilocybin the, yeah. the 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 mushrooms that the aztecs magic also mushrooms, used, magic yeah. mushrooms how those are basically like a hack to to achieve this level of of uh, transcending the self, yes, of transcending the self. The self. Yeah, and, and and what I found really interesting is when he talked about raves and ecstasy, he said that you know in there you had this collective kind of uh, hive switch where where yeah. everyone was in the moment in a, in a state of of euphoria or whatever, and that 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 collective became more than the the sum of the parts if that yeah, makes sense yeah 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 uh, it, it was i was going to say it was pretty trippy but you, <laughs> you know i mean re reading it was it was quite interesting to but it's very interesting but at the same time it's it's so important mm. i mean um, in the sense that he's saying that it's in those moments where we go beyond the self and either, for example, lose ourselves in a bigger group, or that could be a football team, that could be, for example, to, uh, you know, we're going to this concert and there's ecstasy, and then you just... In these moments, he said, you you transcend yourself, you become one with a larger thing, and it said that it's... It's so um, precious for, for, for the psyche in the sense that it, these are the moments that you find the, a lot of meaning. Mm. It's, there's, you find that life has purpose. So psychologically, it's very significant. And it says for a lot of people, it's these moments that for many years they work towards. Um, so that's why um, that um, if, for example, a person, you know, because traditionally a lot of religions try to provide this for people. A, a sense of where you go and lose yourself and you find this you know it's like this sense of awe this sense of unity with others unity mm -hmm. with everything and so when religions for example fail to do that people look for these kind of experiences elsewhere and so for example concerts rock concerts or these raves or football even like when you chant in synchrony with everyone else um, it, it gives you this feeling and now That's he's why I wore my you'll never walk alone uh, there we go yeah. you never walk alone <laughs> and you can see actually for, yeah. for a lot of people going to a stadium is a religious experience yeah, in this yeah. sense and um, and he's saying that even in corporations now they're trying to do that so for example in the corporation if they come together and they sync sync you know in, in, in sync and in harmony they sing something together and they do the same movement yeah. cooperation goes higher there's that scene in uh, Wolf of Wall Street 
Okay, I haven't where, seen them. Where they yet. all kind of chant together. There you go. Um, yeah, I, I like you. you it, it's so definitely when you know people always talk about football. Yeah. Um, and comparing it to religion. Yeah. And and I've I found that uh, reading this book and and when he actually talks about the topic of of sports, <laughs> with the background of of understanding all of the psychological stuff, yeah. you can almost reason and rationalize and understand why What's football happening. is such a religion for people and yeah as you said it is it is that it is but and it's providing an alternative means towards that experience and football is a very good example i think to talk about the point that why is he talking about this mm. and it's basically that idea that this yeah this losing yourself in the bigger collective it's very good it binds people together helps them cooperative cooperate but at the same time this is within the confines of one group and in rivalry to other groups so even in a football team for example you see that the fans of the same team are so in sync with each other but with the rival team you know you know better than me what happens so he's saying that this is also what happens you become blind you don't see the arguments of the other group and so uh, this is part Part of the reason why, um, if we don't try, then on political debates and uh, religious debates, we become so polarized yeah. because we become so focused on our own group that we can't see the you can't hear the other group, and it's very interesting. Even some things, for example, oxytocin, was known to increase people's love for others. Now studies show that it only increases your love for others in your own group. Mm. which is again very interesting but it does not do that to other people so maybe that's a good place to i, I was gonna say we, we, we've spoken a lot um yeah. but i feel like we only scratched the surface yeah because the the, the book like it goes into a lot more detail on, on all the different areas but to see out the the first half of the podcast if we go through our ratings so we have three uh categories readability practicality and depth or quality of insight so readability out of 10 you go first so I go first yeah I gave it a five. Five? Um, like you said earlier, like the first third of the book, I wanted to scratch my eyes out, although I was listening to it, but I wanted to scratch my ears out, I guess. Um, but then I kind of, I had to persevere because I'm like, we, we're doing a podcast. <laughs> um, and actually, I enjoyed the second half very much. Yeah. So it, it is a bit of an uphill struggle initially, but then I did enjoy it. But I gave it a five because I think it is quite dense. Yeah. Um, especially in contrast to a lot of the other stuff that I've read. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it would be a seven. Okay. Seven in readability because, as yeah, same thing as you said. Initially, yeah. it takes some time to get used to what he's talking about. What's our second criteria? Practicality. Practicality. You can go first on this one. For me, ten. Ten? This is something I'm very interested about. In the next part, in, in yeah. the second part of the podcast, we'll talk about why this is so so important for me. Okay. I gave it a seven. Okay. Because it, it, it definitely gave me a lot of food for thought, a lot of realizations, but... I think it, it started a lot of thoughts and conversations in my own head um, and I've still got to kind of continue that. So mm. it, was, it was good, definitely, but it was also very theoretical and obviously at times things don't necessarily apply to you and, mm. and you have to really do a lot of work to, to yeah. see how you can unpack it, which will hopefully Makes do. Makes sense. Depth and quality of insight. Um, I would say for a person with a psychology background and of course I think he has a philosophy background as well, I would say... Um, Nine. Nine? Yeah. I gave it a nine as well. Yeah. I thought I thought uh, it covered a lot of ground um, and, and everything was very well reasoned and, and laid out in terms of the arguments and the way that he presents things. Yeah. And I, I definitely learned a lot reading this. Same. Same. I don't know how much I've retained. I'm yeah. hoping to... And this thing, I, I want to start revisiting these books as well. Yeah. But it, there, there was a lot in there. Okay, there we go. My, my overall score was seven out of ten. I can't remember your numbers. What were your numbers? I'm going to try and do the maths. I think it was seven. Seven. And then at the ten. end was seven, ten, nine. Seven, ten, nine. nine seven, ten, nine. Nineteen plus seven is twenty-six out of thirty. I'm gonna do my calculator. This is why it's good to have a phone. Let me do this. Yeah, but I'll say that in the second part. So after this is done, now we're going to talk about how some of these are. Eight point six out of ten. Eight point six out. Good, it's good a rating. very good book. It's a very good book. I okay. think it's a very good book. So you you said practicality. Let, let's just in, in in the epilogue to start off. Yeah. Uh, this is obviously the part of the podcast where we want to kind of. Um, analyze the book in a bit more depth maybe critique it some of the narratives whatever you said it's a 10 out of 10 very practical book can you explain why yeah so um i have so many things in my mind let's see which ones i which ones we get time to talk about and yeah. where does where does the discussion go 
I as have been very interested in this. Why is it that people cannot see the truth in the other groups, right? And this was this is actually why I picked up the book. Mm. It was a few years ago. By the way, I borrowed the book from Library of University, <laughs> and for forty years, I read one page and I never got to finish it. And the day I returned it, I hadn't finished it. But I always thought about it because the idea was very interesting for me. Mm. Then, as soon as uni finished, I had time. I read it and I fell in love with with the idea. I'm not saying the conclusions are still there, but the idea that why is it that we can't see other people's point? You know, um, I have some background in theology as well, and for me, it was very interesting. How come people from different religions go to theology schools? And the idea of a theology class is that let's go and reason to see which religion is true. And people go to different schools and come up with different conclusions. So usually if you're Muslim, you go to a Muslim theology school, you go out convinced that, yes, reason shows that Islam is the correct religion. If you're a Christian, you go to, for example, your theology class, you call reason shows that Christianity. That was very interesting for me, you know. If, if this is reason, then how come you're coming up with different conclusions mm. and it very much confirms what the idea you already had. Yeah. You know, 97% of Muslims going to a theology school, they come up Muslims. Same with Christianity, same with Judaism. And this is not even religion. So um, even a lot of, for example, people now who don't have a religion, if they go and research, they may come up probably with the same re conclusion that no religion is the answer. So that was very interesting for me. How come people... Um, okay, so, I, uh, I mean, let's maybe move slightly away from the book. How, so, to, if we pose that question... Yeah. No, if we pose that question, yeah. w why do you think that is? Well, that's basically what Jonathan's trying to answer. Yeah. First of all, he would say that uh, a lot of these decisions are not coming from your reasoning, right? Mm. So, it's it's more intuition than reasoning and what reasoning does is tries to justify the things that you already believe in right so a lot of the times when people go and they think that through reasoning they're trying to see what's the truth they're not he says it's not like you're a scientist looking for a truth you know it's like you're a lawyer finding evidence for what you want to prove mm. and, and a lot of the times i actually think that's that's very true like, even my own experience showed that a lot of people that's what they do and but not everyone, by the way, which is very interesting. And it's the people who are actually truth seeking are usually not very much appreciated by their own groups because a lot of the times truth seeking, even though everyone's saying we're truth seeking, but the ones who are actually truth seeking are considered the ones who are betraying the group. So you can see very much that the process of finding truth is happening within a group and truth is secondary to the group itself. Right. So you want to go there and prove that our group is correct and you bend the truth towards yourself. And that's why, because you're working within a group, you can't see what the other groups are saying. Right? How, how can you? So I get what you're saying, that there are obviously people outside of, of, of uh, this that are able to break through this. But then as someone and we all are part of various groups and we identify in different ways and, and we, we associate with different entities and whatever else. How, how can you begin to to? break free of what seems to be very much intuition like it's something that's innate yeah a lot of these things where we're instantly going to see someone that tells us that our group is not right is a threat yeah how how can we begin to kind of break away from that kind of thinking because it's not as you said it's not a rational thing so it's not even about thinking it's about feeling yeah yeah a lot of it is just about preservation of the group yeah. a lot of, yeah so how can we do that it's actually very interesting because if you look at for example a lot of the scriptures. Yeah. You see that the main problems of the prophets is actually with this question. A lot of the times the prophets, different prophets, come to the people and say, let's look at the truth. And they're like, no, we care about what our ancestors say. You know, you see that in many scriptures. You see this in Quran. You see this in earlier scriptures. That the prophets would come and say, let's think together again. But people would say, no, we go with what our group is saying. Mm. And you can see, so you can see that this has been the struggle for, 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 for a long time. People saying, I want to do what my group has been doing for the, for the past. And a person who comes and says, no, let's, let's figure it out together. So I actually think that there is a way of life that enables us to become okay with truth-seeking because truth-seeking is psychologically so costly. 
you know, because you're going against all of these things. For example, the, the loyalty thing. And you have to really open up your psyche and like, you know, like because you have all of these psychological ties to your group. And let's say, for example, I follow religion that my truth seeking is telling me it's wrong. It's very costly psychologically to do that. And so there's a way of life that makes it easier for you to do that. And I think that's what um, prophets came to achieve. And I think even up to now, I don't think we're that much there yet. So. <laughs> Um, but that's why I said this is very interesting for me because I had realized this that yeah. giving people facts does not do anything which is what he said as well that you can't talk to people's rider you have to talk to their intuition talk to the elephant you have to talk to them emotionally and that is very true he, uh, you know I, I've seen this in my experience that giving people facts does nothing and it's interesting because he even says that sometimes when you give people facts against their belief actually makes them more convinced in their own belief you know why? Because you're telling them a fact. You would expect that they get the fact, they put it in their system like, oh, my previous information is wrong. Let's believe in the right thing. But no, the fact comes not as a new piece of information, as an attack on the group. Mm. What is my morality telling me? Attack on the group is immoral. So whatever you say, I don't even hear it. I just hear you're attacking my group. That's immoral. You're a bad person. So, you know what I mean? And so it, so this is why I love the book, because he's scientifically explaining some of these things that I had experienced but couldn't. Um, but I, I, again, like, <laughs> I think about, um, and this is this is like one of the things that, that it got me thinking about a lot, is that, you know, when you look at the political spectrum, whether it's religious or, or actual mainstream politics or anything, any yeah. sort of division, even sports, yeah. that, that people are so entrenched in, in all these different spaces that even if like a few people manage to break away and manage to read the book and just understand how the human brain works, the, the majority of society still move in certain ways. Like, like Jonathan uh, Haidt says himself, he, he, uh, he spoke about how he was advising the, the Democratic um, Party about, uh, was he speech writing for them as well? I can't remember. I he was, he yeah, had, yeah. So he yeah, was John, yeah. John McCain's campaign. I, think. I believe he was. I don't was, know for who, but he was. Yeah, so he, he was he was working on like the wording um, and making sure that they appealed to more than one. This was beautiful, actually, because um, he basically was looking at which moral receptors, the if we look at them as taste buds, which yeah. taste buds are being tingled by the words that are being put out. Yeah, in the so campaign. he would make sure that every statement or every yeah. like final line would touch at least two or three of these taste buds yeah. so that it's it's appealing to different people on different levels. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, it, it, it kind of made me a bit scared because yeah. I'm thinking how much are we being programmed and manipulated and played by mm. by politicians, by everyone, right? Yeah. Anyone that is, that is speaking at length to us, if yeah. they have any understanding of these kind of moral foundations, yeah. you can very easily manipulate people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the thing, which means that they've realized, a lot of people in the political power, yeah. they've realized that people don't reason to their opinions. They feel their way into their opinions. So if I know how to make you feel a certain way, yeah. I can make you believe a certain thing. Right? And so, yeah, it's, it's very so, interesting. But, okay, but you, again, I'm going to keep pressing on this. You said it's practical. What, what, what for you are the practical takeaways? Number one, beyond understanding this, because I think on one level we can always understand, like I, I've, I've learned this stuff and I've, I've understood some of the principles, but then how am I implementing that practically? What am I actually doing with this information? How, how do we, because th I think that's, that's the risk or, or that's the thing, like when you read and, and you know, hopefully over the course of this podcast, we're going to read loads of different books. Yeah. I want to be able to walk away. And this one, like, you know, we wanted to have one practical takeaway each. I don't really have one. Mm. Um, I just have like a bunch of information that's really interesting and like, you know, talking points when I'm talking to my friends, I'm like, oh, did you know this? Yeah. About Hive Switch and whatever else. But w w what are we, how are we implementing what's here into like our, our day to day? Yeah, it, 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 I, I get you. But for me, you know, practicality. Listen, you gave it a 10 out of 10. Yeah, you, because you, but for me, practical doesn't necessarily mean that I can use it tonight when I go and have food. What, what, you know, because mm. with Dan Ariely, it was like that. It was <laughs> immediately you could use it. But for me, even if it helps me know what to do in the next 10 years or how to design my life, I yeah. call that practical. And even this point that we just discussed, it means that people really need to, really, really, really need to. And for example, my understanding is that um, this is what religion is, to be honest with you, of making um, sure that these type of groupish things do not 
um, impair your judgment because it's definitely going to do that. Right? So live in a certain way, Hassan, I think that is what religion is according to me. Mm. F- live in such a way that you are not blind to the truths of other groups or to the truth in general. Right? So, so this is a very important thing. And the first step is to know that this is how you are right now. Your group is blinding you to the truth. So for me, this is huge. It's huge. But maybe another also interesting thing that because I'm seeing that I don't want to get the episode too long, we can go a little bit to the hive thing as well. That's yeah. very interesting as well. Mm. The idea that humanity from long time ago had these mechanisms of losing themselves in a larger thing. And then it was those moments actually that he gave quotes from different poets, philosophers, that these are the moments we live for. These are the moments that give meaning to life. When you, you know feel one, when you feel that unity, when you feel that. And I feel like we are right now in a time where people are thirsty for these type of experiences. Right, because um, a lot of traditional ways of having these are not providing them. So religion um, is really failing in a lot of areas to to provide this feeling for people. See, religion was meant to actually give people an experience in which you manage to really break free from your from yourself, and because you know when you're a selfish person, it's mm. actually very psychologically costly because you have to take care of yourself. You have to make sure everyone's nice to you. You have to make sure everyone loves you. You have to make sure, you know what I mean? It's so anxious to, to, to care about yourself. And so when you break free from that and you find yourself, no, I'm part of a larger group, it's just so relaxing for the psyche. It's like all the pressure to be okay, to be good enough, all of that is removed. You feel at one, you feel like life has meaning, purpose. This is amazing. And religion was meant to give people that, was meant to give people this real experience. And now a lot of them have even forgotten this was part of their job, you know. And I think this is very good because he's also talking about some of the mechanisms. Because I think any religious priest, imam, whatever, has to be very much experienced and aware of the machinery of inducing this hive switch Mm, on people. Yeah. Right. You have to know how to be able to create this for people. And so now he's saying that there are some uh, CEOs who are learning these things to to create this environment in their corporation. Well, I think religion should do that. And and you can see that people are increasingly chasing these through psilocybin, you know, like going magic mushroom, ayahuasca. Um, you, you can see that humanity is saying, I am tired of just being the chimp. Give me the B part as well. Mm. I need that. And so uh, this is why, again, this was very interesting for me. I'm trying to think. I, I think uh, well, I just now I mentioned that, you know, maybe there's nothing. Oh, I, I don't have a takeaway. I, I think mm. for me, definitely one of the key um, takeaways actually is, is this, this notion that we, we keep talking about with the elephant and the, the, the rider. rider, which I think was actually beautiful. Mm. Um, and obviously we, we, we've kind of explored it, but just generally that that basic understanding because i i think with all of this and 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 hopefully you know with all the books that we talk about for someone like me i don't think about a lot of these things i i I don't because i haven't studied psychology i haven't looked at any of this stuff so i i don't know them as you say like you know we need our priests we need our imams Mm -hmm. to understand human machinery and how the brain works and Mm -hmm. and what we're trying to tap into but likewise on a personal level i don't know what i'm searching for i don't know what i'm looking for so actually just having a basic understanding of how my body works mm. <laughs> how like uh it's like biology but for the mind almost yeah. you know like having that roadmap because yeah. we're never taught that we're never taught to actually understand how we're how we're programmed mm. how um instances in our lives affect us and influence us and change yeah. us and 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 li- like you said i think just the exercise of thinking about the different groups that we're a part of mm. and how we identify with them and and, and again just hypothetically going through different permutations of, okay, if this were to happen, how would I feel? If someone attacked my friend, mm. if someone verbally online said this, yeah. well, what would I do? How would I feel? And where is that coming from? Yeah. Because we're not rationally looking at whether the attack or whether what they're saying is correct or not. It's just, must I believe this or can I believe this, depending on what's being yeah. said? Yeah. Um, and, and and that, for me, I think would be my kind of overall takeaway. For, for yourself, I know there's a lot and, and you've, you, you love this book, but what's if there was one key message takeaway thing uh what would it be 
Ooh, it's difficult to pick one. I think the things I discussed, these are my... You, you I'm very one. passionate about. Pick one. Pick one? Yeah. I'm going to be really focusing on trying to... For me, it's this. I really want to devote my life yeah. to figuring this out and helping myself and others get over the mac the mechanisms that are blinding us to the truth. Mm -hmm. This is very important for me, like to help all of us get over the groupish things that makes loyalty more important than truth for us. That That's my, that's like, I, I can't say anything else, but I can say take away that maybe parents would enjoy. You know, this rider and the elephant thing, this is very important when you want to talk to people. A lot of the times when people get frustrated when they're talking to their child is that they're talking to the rider and children's rider is actually even poorer than adults because, you know, prefrontal cortex which is where a lot of the these type of moral reasoning takes place the teenagers is still not developed in them yet it's like 21 or two, it's like takes really into your early 20s where the prefrontal cortex is is strong mm. so when you're talking to a teenager you're not really talking to the writer at all you have to very much be aware of that right and so if you want to for example convince your child you can't just tell them don't be scared when you're telling someone don't be scared you're talking to the rider whereas we just very much said that it's the elephant who's who's in power the mm. intuition the emotion so you have to figure out ways to talk to the emotion right uh, and there's a very good book on that maybe one week we could do that it's called the whole brain child say for example in a restaurant and your child is throwing a tantrum so he's saying, I don't want this food. I don't want this food. Get me another food. If you tell them behave, what are you doing? Moral reasoning. We just said that moral reasoning doesn't work. You have to talk to the elephant, right? So you and then it goes through how can you talk to the elephant of your child? How can you talk to their emotions, you know? And, and to get them without telling them what to do to help them. Mm. So maybe we can. So this is, I think, a, an interesting takeaway for parents that be aware of this. Sounds like a, a, a good potential book, as you mentioned. Um, the final thing uh, is next week's book or yes. next podcast book. Next podcast book. Um, so we picked up. So I, I, I figured this one was quite heavy um, and, and, and was a long listen. I, I, I should clarify because one of my friends actually called me out on this. I don't read the books. I listen to them. Yeah. And I'm OK with that. Yeah. I think it counts. You should know that about Salim that he does not he does not read books. This is why I struggle with the bios. Even when even when I wrote a book, you, you know what's the first thing you told me? <laughs> Javod, I'm not going to read your book unless it's an audio book. Yeah, I need me. an audio book just for you. So. I, I, didn't, I haven't finished it yet. You haven't even I, done I the start, audio book. I started it. Then that started, really hurts listen, because I started re I started listening to it. I but by the way, when I, I say reading, where's my heart? Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere inside is really hurting. For me, it's reading. So I started reading it, okay. and then I got distracted because we started this project. Okay, so no, I've that's been reading good. These. Uh, that's fair enough. So, fair anyways, enough. after Next, yeah. uh, after this twelve hour read, that's I, that's how long books are for me now yeah. in hours. Um, I thought we'd do something lighter, mm -hmm. so I picked uh, Atomic Habits. Yeah. Um, written by James Clear and the kind of subheading is an easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones yeah um, I started it uh, as a little prequel uh, prequel no sequel to, to next next podcast I started it and I was like oh it's like five hours it's brilliant it's like a it's like a walk in it's like watching yeah. a trailer now yeah, yeah. it's so easy um, it's, it's a much lighter read but I, 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 light, I think yeah. um, a lot of people have mentioned this book, mm -hmm. talk about this book, have read this book, and I thought it'd be good to kind of explore yeah. uh, the themes. I felt like today was a bit heavy. How did you find it? Yeah, I felt it too. And if people... There was no, there was no uh, bells. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if people felt like today was very, very heavy, etc. Just unsubscribe and never next come back. No, next oh, no. one's not going to be like okay. this. <laughs> next one's going to be very light, very fun, yeah, very yeah. useful. So, yeah. yeah, actually, I think I think what we try to achieve in this podcast, this episode was to lower the standard so that the next one is actually very enjoyable. There That's we go. Exactly. I like <laughs> there it. We go. Um but yeah, thank you guys for listening. We are on Instagram. Uh not a book club pod was the best thing I could find in terms of an Instagram handle. Yeah. Um but do follow us and and as I said read along and uh message us with your thoughts, your comments, whatever. And we we do as I said from next episode, we do want to try and get more interactive, get more yeah. people uh, engaging at your thoughts as well and questions or whatever it might be. Yeah. And that's it. Um, and, uh, do you yeah. want a, our weekly or our monthly reminder? A monthly reminder? That this is not on.
Yeah, I, I wanted to oh, say it, oh, but sorry. now you, okay, you, you made it, it weird. So, you made uh, Joanne, it weird. Would you like to end with our monthly reminder? You don't need to say it. Sorry, I'll just okay. say it myself. You just say that last thing again. Okay, bye, guys. And you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're ruining it. Anyway, basically. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I hope you enjoyed it's this. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And uh, don't forget, this is not a book club. That was like an eight out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get we'll get it better next time. <laughs> I I had it in mind to say it. I had it in mind. To I, say I I thought you looked like you weren't going to. That's why. No no okay. no. I looked like I know what I'm doing.